Shabbat Shalom, Shema Yisrael. Welcome to a new way for us to have our teachings together for our Shabbats for the next little while. We trust that you found the connection well and that you will be able to see our PowerPoint that is behind me and be able to plug in and feel that we are still connected even if we are apart because we are one in the Spirit, we are one in the Lord, we are Echad, we are united, and we are going to have a wonderful time studying the Tabernacle. The Tabernacle is what our parasha has been on for a little while, it is still in that section this time, but uh, I want to draw your attention to more than just what is in our parasha for this week, and it will take us a number of sessions to go through the Tabernacle in depth and in detail. The instructions given for the Tabernacle are in Shmot, Exodus chapters 25 to 27, and the construction is Shemot chapters 36 through 38. However, in the original covenant, there are over 50 chapters that talk about the construction of the tabernacle. And more than 40% of the book of Hebrews in our Brit Hadashah deals with the tabernacle and its implications also. So with this much devotion to the tabernacle in the Word of God, it must mean that it is of utmost importance. Moshe easily could have given just the instructions in those first few chapters of, of Exodus, chapters 25 to 27, and then he could have said they followed the directions and it was done, but instead he uses the next several chapters to spell out in detail all of the making of the tabernacle and each of the individual pieces. So again, obviously there's importance to this that we need to spend a bit of time digging deep and finding out what it means. First of all, what is the purpose for the tabernacle? The purpose given for the tabernacle is in Shemot in Exodus chapter 25 and verse 8, where we read, They are to make me a sanctuary so that I may live among them. We also read about this living among God in the book of Revelation, chapter 21 and verse 3. It's looking to a future time. But Yochanan John, the author, says, I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, or behold, God's Shekhinah, God's glory, is with mankind, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and he himself, God with them, he will be their God. Again, we're seeing the importance of God dwelling with his people, his people dwelling with God. And that is why uh, <coughs> the tabernacle was made in the first place, some people say that the word mishkan, which means dwelling, actually came from the root lishkan. Lishkan means to rest. It's the resting place for the Shekhinah glory. And the idea was that in mishkan ha idut mishkan, it would be the, the testimony of the resting place of the Shekhinah glory of God. Uh, that would testify to God's forgiveness for his people even after they made the golden calf, because this took place after the golden calf. So again, we have many names for our tabernacle, everything from Mishkan, meaning dwelling, to the tent of the meeting, to the Lishkan, uh, to the tabernacle, and I probably can't think of another name, but there probably is another one in scripture. But uh, we know the focal point of the whole tabernacle now is the dwelling place for God among mankind. The tabernacle also was a picture of redemption. As we know overall, when Moshe assembled the tabernacle, he anointed all of its components with sacred anointing oil, and that was called the Shemen Ha Mishchan. Shemen is oil in Hebrew. Mishcha is anointed, and that comes from the root Mashiach, Messiah, indicating that the Mishkan, the tabernacle, was a foreshadow of God's plan of redemption given in Mashiach. Mashiach, Messiah, means anointed one. Sometimes we hear the English word Christ given. Christ means anointed one from the Greek. And so what we really have in Yeshua's name, when we say Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah, we're not giving a first and a last name, but we're giving his name Yeshua, and we're being told of his, uh, his 
his work, what he is doing, what he's accomplishing for us as the anointed one, anointed of God, pictured by this oil, and oil we know in the scripture is also a picture of the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, so we see our triunity, our three in one, being pictured in this tabernacle. We have the presence of God, we have very God himself, and we have the anointed one, our Mashiach. Now because the Lamb, the, I'm sorry, because the law condemned us, the tabernacle is going to give us the way of salvation. Again, it's a picture of Yeshua, it's a picture of his being salvation for us, and it shows his ultimate redemption for the earth. It would face toward the east, that's toward the direction of the coming one, and it's representing him coming his second time uh, when he comes, his second coming. He will come to the Mount of Olives, which is on the east of Jerusalem, and that is why it would be facing toward the east. Uh, we get that from Zechariah, Zechariah chapter 14 and verse 4. On that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which lies to the east of Jerusalem, and the Mount of Olives will be split in half from east to west to make a huge valley. Half of the mountain will move toward the north and half of it toward the south. Malachi, Malachi chapter 4 and verse 2 also refers to the, the coming of the Lord to his temple. The temple he is coming to is the earthly temple. The temple was the permanent where the tabernacle was the, the one that could be picked up and moved. So it was a, a temporary, it was one that was not set permanently down. Uh, even though of course it was set in different locations as they moved. Uh, but none of these were the original. We are told that it was patterned after the heavenly. We read that also in Shemot in Exodus 25:40, which says, See that you make them after the pattern for them, which was shown to you on the mountain. This is when God was spoken to Moshe, and so he was telling Moshe, Make it after the pattern that you saw. That means he saw something before the tabernacle was even made, and the tabernacle was to be a replica of what he saw. Hebrews, our book to our, our Hebrew people in the Brit HaKadoshah, chapter 9, verses 23 through 26, also deals with this a little more explicitly, saying, Now, this is how the copies of the heavenly things had to be purified, but the heavenly things themselves require better sacrifices than these. For the Messiah has entered a holiest place, which is not man-made and merely a copy of the true one, but into heaven itself, in order to appear now on our behalf in the very presence of God. Did you catch that? That he entered the holiest place, which is not man-made, not merely a copy of the true one. And we are told that he entered into the heavens, so we know that the true tabernacle, the original, the one that he entered into, into the holiest place, was literally the heavenly one in the presence of our very God. Verses 25 and 26 read, Further, he did not enter heaven to offer himself over and over again, like the Kohen Haggadah who enters the holiest place year after year with blood that is not his own, for then he would have had to suffer death many times from the founding of the universe on. But as it is, he has appeared once at the end of the ages in order to do away with sin through the sacrifice of himself. So we have the complete sacrifice of Messiah once and for all, being the great high priest, entering into the most holy place, not made with hands, made in the heavens. He put his sinless, perfect, sacrificial blood, sacrificed for us, given in our place, that would purify heaven for us. We would come through that shed blood into heaven. That is why we now can go into the presence of our holy God when we leave this earthly shell and depart to be with him. Now it's very interesting also to note that this Shabbat, March 21st, 2020, is Parashat Vayachel and it means that he assembled. The scriptures that we're reading is Shemot, Exodus 35, 1 through 38 to 20. But this is the second description of the Mishkan and the furnishings that we find in the Torah. The first description came between chapters 25 and 34 in Shemot. 
And there are several possible reasons why we see this second time. One could easily be because the Lord's purpose is never thwarted. So even if man sins, and we know that between the first description and the second description that we're getting now, came the time period of the golden calf. We know that all that did at best, or at worst however I should say that, was that it was a delay in the completion of God's perfect will. That it did not thwart his perfect will, it did not stop his perfect will, it did not derail his perfect will, and in fact he knew the timing all along. So it's to us it seems that it, it was an interruption to his timing, but it would not have even been to him. Another reason is that the Mishkan and all the blood atonement rituals that uh, we see in relation to this tabernacle, and we'll understand that as we go through each and every part of the tabernacle, that, that, that the way to God was through the blood of the sacrificial, and I'm going to say victim, although Yeshua himself, when he became the sacrifice for us, was not a victim in the sense he freely gave his life for us. It wasn't something that was thrust on him, something that he did not agree to. We know that before he ever left heaven, it was his sole purpose to come to be the sacrifice for us. He came knowing and choosing to do that, to be that, and ultimately does fulfill the blood requirement of the, the sacrifice that we see pictured through the tabernacle, so he fulfills as Mashiach all that is needed. Yet there's still one more possibility that's very interesting to these two times of the description of the tabernacle and all of the, uh, the elements that go with it. And that is that the first time we have the description given and then we know the golden calf happened. We could also correlate that to the first coming of Messiah. We know that he came, that he dwelt among men, tabernacled with them as our Hebrew says in Yochanan 1 and verse 14. And we know that at that time the nation as a whole rejected or missed the opportunity for national salvation because they did not accept him as the Messiah, as the sacrifice, as the Lamb of God who does take away the sin of the world. The second time when Mashiach comes at his second advent, the whole nation at that time will be cleansed. We read in, in Romans uh, chapter 11, verses 25 through 27, we read uh, that Sha'ol Paul uh, told us that at that time all Israel shall be saved, or in essence shall be delivered, but the nation as a whole would be brought into that saving point at this time. How does that happen? Because this is when they as a whole, as a nation, no longer reject Messiah, but accept him. We read that in Zechariah, Zechariah chapter 12 and verse 10. And I'd like to take us to that because I think it's very important to read that scripture in its entirety and to see all that is being said in that verse uh, in relation to what I've been sharing with you just now. So Zechariah, Zechariah chapter 12 and verse 10 says, and this is God speaking, it says, I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplication. Right away we have Jehovah speaking, God the Father who is speaking. We have the spirit mentioned that he is going to pour out the spirit of grace and of supplication uh, on Jerusalem so that they will look on me. Now remember, God's still speaking. So they will look on me whom they have pierced. When was God pierced? Well, we know there's only one time that God was pierced, and we know that he was pierced when he took on the human form of Yeshua, and that he was pierced by the nails when he was crucified on the cross or on the tree. And as they see now, as they look at Yeshua, as they look at him as he is coming the second time, they look on him whom they pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son, and they will weep bitterly over him, like the, weep, the bitter weeping over a firstborn. What does that mean? They mourn, they lament, I, you were our Messiah, we missed it the first time, and now 
they are opening their hearts to him and accepting him and on their lips will be Baruch haba Hashem Adonai Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. This is when Messiah will put his feet on the Mount of Olives. We read about it already being cleft in two where there would be a wide valley maybe because he's going to need to bring in a huge tabernacle, actually temple I should say at that point, where all the nations of the world will come up during the millennial reign, the thousand year reign of Messiah on earth from Jerusalem, sitting on the throne of David in the temple to fulfill all of the promises that he gave to David and to the children of Israel. This is when Israel will be the head nation of the world. This is when Messiah sits on the throne and rules from earth as well as ruling, of course, from heaven. And this is the second advent, the second time that he has come, the first time as a suffering servant, lowly, humble, and sacrificed as the Lamb of God. The second time coming as the Lion of the tribe of Judah, roaring and being majestic, King of the jungle, coming back, crowned in glory, in the Shekhinah glory, seen for who he is, and received now as King Messiah, King Mashiach, setting Israel up as the head nation of the world and fulfilling all those promises to her that have been given and have not been fulfilled yet. So we have a wonderful promise of what is coming, and it is interesting to see that at the first time, they, the nation as a whole missed it, and so we have this repeat time of his coming back when they do receive him. And maybe we can see that in the description of the tabernacle the first time, the golden calf happening in, in between, showing that they rejected the truth and did not stay pure to their God. They are never to worship any other God. God says, I'm a very jealous God that shall have no other gods before me. And now, the, in the second advent, we see the description given the second time. And we realize and remember, again, that this is all a picture of redemption. How can I say that? Well, if we go to our next picture on the PowerPoint, we see that all the furniture in the tabernacle is in the form of a cross. We're going to see that each article speaks of Yeshua. We're going to see as we go through that cross, the whole complete picture of redemption given in it. And uh, in the description, in the scripture, we go from the end, from the Holy of Holies, all the way out. The instructions start with how to make the ark in the Holy of Holies, in the mercy seat. You read that in Shemot, Exodus chapter chapter 25 and verse 10 and it finishes at the brazen altar and the court at the outside of, or the, the further way out just okay the altar is right inside the courtyard so to speak so you're right at the edge of it you come from the holy polies all the way out that's how we read it in scripture because scripture is showing us how Yeshua came from the presence of God. The presence of God dwells in the Holy of Holies, in the most holy place. And he came from the presence of God to go to the cross. Remember all the furniture forming that cross. And so we study it. Uh, we see that he went from in to out because he came to, to go to the cross. But we study it from the out in because the only way we can come into Elohim's presence is by way of the cross. The only way to go to the cross is to come through the brazen altar where the sacrifice is given first. So we will study it going in where Messiah acted it coming out. Now we also have symbolic meanings in our tabernacle. We have the meanings in the colors. We have the meanings in the materials used. And again, each will speak to a part of uh, will in some way show us a picture of Yeshua. I'll uh, give you those points quickly, and then as we go through it, we will go over these many different times. So if you don't get them all right in the beginning, you will be hearing it repeated. As we look at the meaning of the colors, we'll go to the next picture on our PowerPoint where you can see the colors, and you see blue. Blue is a heavenly color. It reminds us of the deity of Yeshua, and we uh, know that from scripture from our uh, Jewish apostle Yochanan John in chapter 1 and verse 1 where he 
says, and I quote, In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. This is declaring to us that the Word and God are one and the same. We are seeing the deity because it is that Word that in chapter 1 and verse 14 comes and dwells, tabernacles among men. We also see the purple color. Purple speaks to us of royalty. And we know that he, Messiah, Mashiach, is king of Israel. Let's look at another good Jewish book written by a Jewish author to a Jewish audience. It is the first in what's called the Gospels in the Brit Hadashah, and I'm referring to Matthew chapter 2. We're going to look at Matthew 2 and verse 2 where we read, uh, and, and if I give you verse 1, it tells you uh, that the Magi had come from the east, they'd arrived in Jerusalem, they'd come to Herod the king, uh, as he was ruling in these days and they were looking for Yeshua who had been born because they said and, and this is verse 2 where is he who has been born king of the Jews for we saw his star in the east and we have come to worship him they recognized Yeshua the one who was born in Bethlehem in Bethlehem as being the one who is uh, uh, king of Israel they were looking for the king. That's why they went to the palace and not to a humble abode. Let me also show you that from Luke, Luke chapter 1 and verse, whoops, Luke, cha, sorry, uh, my mistake, my mistake again on my tablet. I'm sorry for the delay for a moment, but we're going to look at Luke chapter 1. And we will see verses 32 and 33. Luke 1, 32 and 33, we read, He will be great. He will be called the Son of Ha El Yom, Adonai, that's Most High God, Lord God, will give him the throne of his forefather David, David, and he will rule the house of Yaakov, Jacob, forever. There will be no end to his kingdom. This is the one who is promised to Israel, and we see that he is to be king. He is to rule over the house of Israel, the house of Jacob, sitting on the throne of his forefather, David, forever, and that he is being called the Son of the Most High God, the Lord God, he himself. Again, we see royalty, we see deity, we see him as king of Israel. We also see the color scarlet in the picture of the, the tabernacle that we're seeing right now. Scarlet reminds us of sacrifice because we see in it the color of blood, bloodshed. So this reminds us of the cross. Again, his purpose was to come to die. And we read this again by Shaul Paul, our Jewish boy who wrote so much for us. And we read in chapter five, uh, yes, chapter 5, verses 8 and 9 of the book called Romans. We read, Romans 5, 8 and 9, that God demonstrates his, love, his own love for us and that the Messiah died on our behalf while we were still sinners. In verse 9, therefore, since we have now come to be considered righteous by means of his bloody sacrificial death, how much more will we be delivered through him from the anger of God's judgment. Here we see then that, that scarlet or red is a picture of sacrifice, of bloodshed, and even a picture of the cross. Again, if we go to that book written to our Hebrew people called Hebrews, we go to chapter 9 of the book of Hebrews. Remember, over 40% of this book speaks to the tabernacle, so we'll be looking at references here from time to time. Chapter 9 and verse 22 of the book to the Hebrews says, in fact, according to the Torah, Almost everything is purified with blood. Indeed, without the shedding of blood is no forgiveness of sins. That reminds us of Leviticus 17.11 that tells us that there isn't forgiveness of sins without the shedding of blood, without the atonement, and that God has freely given us on the altar the atonement for our sins. Another color that we see, and the final color we'll talk about right now, is white. White speaks to us of purity, of righteousness, we look at Yeshaya, our prophet Isaiah, and we look at chapter 1, Isaiah 1, and verse uh, 18. 
In Isaiah 1 and verse 18, we read, Come, let us reason together. Says the Lord, Though your sins are as scarlet, they will be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they will be like wool. So white, we see the, the righteousness, we see the purity that has come through the shed red sacrificial blood. Isaiah, Yeshia also gives us a beautiful picture of the sacrificed lamb in chapter 53. And just one verse out of Isaiah 53 right now, verse 11, we read in that verse, As a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied by his knowledge. The righteous one, my servant, will justify the many. Um, I wanted the, the color there. Um, Okay, well, we, we see our point that the how is one made righteous. It's by the shed blood of Yeshua. So that purity, that's what I wanted to bring out here. That is what makes us pure. Now, it's interesting because the, the um, curtain we're going to see is a white linen. Let us look and see what it tells us about white linen clothing in Revelation chapter 19. Revelation 19 is a picture of Messiah coming back in all of his glory putting a stop to the battle of Armageddon, putting a stop to where he says if he did not come, there'd be no flesh left alive. This is when he comes back to the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem, comma, Israel. And here we are told in Revelation 19 and verse 8, it was given to her to, um, and let me tell, let's read verse 7 so you know who she is. Let us rejoice and be glad and give the glory to him. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. So we're talking about the Lamb of God. The Lamb of God has a bride. The bride are those who have put their faith in him. And it says that to her, to his bride, was given her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. So we see fine linen, white and clean, represents righteousness. How do we get that righteousness? We get it given to us when the Lord clothes us in His righteousness. Our righteousness, Isaiah, Yeshua 64, 6 tells us that our righteousness is as filthy rags, but He clothes us in His righteousness. We put on His righteousness, and then we are seen pure and white. Let's look real quickly at the meaning of the materials that are used in the tabernacle. We'll look at the next picture on our PowerPoint for that. And we see gold. It's a little hard to see the gold and silver in these pictures, but when we go into the details and we look at each part of the tabernacle in depth, we will have pictures that will show it better then. I wanted to give you the overview right now. Gold immediately speaks to us of deity. We recognize that, the gold crown. He is king. We also know that, that gold speaks to to, to his being fully God and fully man, that he is deity. Silver, we see. Silver speaks in scripture of redemption. It's also known as the atonement money. Let's look at a few scriptures to see how we arrive at this so you know it's not something that Rochelle is saying. It's something that scripture teaches us. Let's go first to Bar to Numbers, and let's go to Numbers chapter 18. And we will look at verses 15 and 16. Numbers chapter 18, verses 15 and 16. This is in one of the first five books of the Torah. And we're reading about silver being redemption or atonement money. In Numbers 18, starting with verse 15, it says, Everything that comes first out of the womb of all living things, which they offer to Adonai, whether human or animal, will be yours. However, the firstborn of a human being you must redeem, and the firstborn of an unclean beast you are to redeem. The sum to be paid for redeeming anyone a month or older, a month old or over, is to be five shekels of silver, as you value it, using the sanctuary shekel. This is the same as 20 garaz. But the firstborn of an ox, a sheep, a goat, you're not to redeem their holy. You are to splash the blood against the altar and make their fat go up in smoke as an offering made by fire, as a fragrant aroma for Adonai. Their meat will be yours like the breast that is weighed in the right thigh. They will be yours. All the contributions of holy things which the people of Israel offer to Adonai, 
I have given to you, your sons and your daughters with you. This is a perpetual law, an eternal covenant of salt before Adonai for you and your descendants with you. What did we read in those verses? We read about the redeeming and we read about um, atoning, that uh, the blood was placed on the altar, that's the atonement, and we read that they could give the silver to redeem that firstborn. Uh, we should be seeing um, just a picture of the colors on the number four of our PowerPoint presentation for this, very similar to what we've been looking at. We'll see a new picture in short time, but right now we're, we're just looking at the colors and the materials. Go with me also real quickly while you have what we just read fresh in mind to Shemot, Exodus chapter 30. This is in our Parsha, I believe it's this week. Yeah, it is this week's Parsha. Chapter 30, verses 11 to 16, and we read, The Lord also spoke to Moshe, or Adonai spoke to Moshe, When you take a census of the people of Israel and register them, each upon registration is to pay a ransom for his life to Adonai, to avoid any breakout of plague among you during the time of the census. Every subject to the census is to pay as an offering to Adonai half a shekel by the standard of the sanctuary shekel. And then it says a shekel equals 20 garages. Well, remember when I read that in the passage we were just in prior. So we see that we're talking about a, a, an amount of money that was a redemption to buy back, that they would not be um, slaughtered for having been counted when God said not to count the people because he wanted them to be looking at God. You can read the rest of those verses, 11 through 16, on your own later. Let's move quickly to Zechariah, Zechariah chapter 11. Zechariah 11, verses 12 and 13. In this we read, I said to them, If it's good in your sight, give me my wages. But if not, never mind. So they weighed out 30 shekels of silver as my wages. Then the Lord said to me, throw it to the potter, that magnificent price of which I was valued by them. So I took the 30 shekels of silver and threw them to the potter in the house of the Lord. We know this was foreshadowing of the fact that Judas, Judas would betray Yeshua Jesus for 30 pieces of silver and he took that money feeling repentance, remorse over what he had done and he threw it in um, the, the temple and they used it to uh, buy the potter's field to bury those who did not have money. But we, again, here are seeing in Zechariah 12 and verse 13 that this is um, redemptive money or atoning money. If that's not totally clear to you, go with me to Kepha, to his books, 1 Peter, 1 Kepha, uh, in the Brit in 1 Peter chapter 1, we will look quickly at verses 18 and 19, and I think this will make it very clear to you if it has not been made so by this point. You should be aware that the ransom paid to free you from the worthless way of life which your fathers passed on to you did not consist of anything perishable like silver or gold. On the contrary, it was a costly, bloody, sacrificial death of the Messiah as of a lamb without defect or spot. So here, Kepha, Peter, is making it very clear that the ransom of, of we as a people could not be from silver, which was the normal price you would pay for redemption, that it had to be that bloody sacrifice of Messiah, the lamb without defect. And lastly, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians and chapter 6. And we'll look at verses, verse 20. 1 Corinthians 6, <clears throat> excuse me, and verse 20. For you were bought at a price, so use your bodies to glorify God. So I think we see very clearly silver is redemption. It is atonement money. It was used for the sockets, for the overlay of the tops of the pillars. There are four pillars, I think we can see that in our picture, that hold up the curtains. What you can't see is it's holding them up by silver hooks. So it's very interesting. Four pillars held up by silver hooks. We've already looked at the colors, but four in, in Scripture we see interesting. We have four Gospels that tell us the story of Yeshua, of his first coming here to this earth. And four is the number for the earth. 
there's a universal entrance into the tabernacle that we're going to talk about uh, shortly. Actually, we'll talk about it next week. But uh, the idea is that it's for all of the earth, and we will see that. It was covered in linen. It was embroidered with blue, the heavenly color. And that reminds us of the gospel according to Yochanan. Yochanan, John, shows us that Yeshua was the Son of God. So we see him in his heavenly role, uh, belonging with God on the throne. The color purple that we see reminds us of the gospel according to Matthew, to Mattathiah. This one speaks of Yeshua as king. And remember his royalty, king, kingly royalty, we define that by the color purple. Mark's testimony, Mark's gospel, talks about a suffering servant. And the color that we see there is the scarlet for the shed blood. And finally, we have Luke's testimony, his gospel, which is the righteousness of the Son of Man, or as I should say, the righteous Son of Man. Son of Man being a very messianic title, telling us that he is God, and yet he also took on human form. And remember, the linen is representative of the righteousness. That we said the righteousness is the linen clothes that that Messiah gives to his bride to wear. That linen brings us back to what we were looking at originally, the materials used in the making of the tabernacle pieces. So we've already talked about the linen being righteousness in Revelation 19.8. Now, one last that we have not seen in our next uh, PowerPoint slide will show, acacia wood. It's also called shatim. It is a... Uh, a point that is used in scripture when it talks about the acacia wood to point out the humanity. It's a tree that comes up out of the earth and it can be cut off from the earth. We know that Yeshua was the, the stem that sprouted out of the rod of Jesse. We know that acacia wood is going to talk to his humility, his humbleness. We'll see that at other times. And uh, so we know that, that we are seeing the humanity of the Son of Man at the same time, we're seeing his deity and his royalty. One a material that we haven't talked about yet is brass, or sometimes it's called bronze, and that speaks to us of divine judgment. Go with me quickly to Numbers, Bar, Numbers, and we're going to go to Numbers chapter 21. And Numbers 21 says, uh, let's see, we're going to look at verse 5. Verses 5 through 9. Numbers 21. The people spoke against Adonai, or against God, and against Moshe. Why did you bring us up out of Egypt? To die in the desert? There's no real food. There's no water. We're sick of this miserable stuff we're eating, this miserable food. In response, Adonai sent poisonous snakes among the people that bit the people, and many of the Israeli people died. The people came to Moshe and said, We've sinned by speaking against Adonai and against you. Pray to Adonai that he rid us of these snakes. Moshe prayed for the people, and Adonai answered Moshe, Make a poisonous snake and put it on a pole. When anyone who has been bitten sees it, he will live. So Moshe made a bronze snake and put it on a pole. If a snake had bitten someone, then when he looked toward the bronze snake, he stayed alive. So we see the judgment, and we see them being released from that judgment. Uh, we will also see brass and bronze used in the sacrificial offerings, actually in the brazen altar, so we'll talk about it more then. Um, just lastly, in this point, is Yochanan, John, chapter 3 and verse 24, where we read in John 3, 24, Okay, I have not got the right reference, and I'm sorry for that. Uh, let's try 3.14. Yochanan, John 3.14, here we are, refers to what we just read in Numbers. And Moshe, just as Moshe lifted up the serpent in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. We know that they looked to what was lifted up. The judgment was abated for them as they looked to the Son of Man who was lifted up on that tree to be crucified for us, that there our judgment is taken away from us. It is abated, and we are made righteous. So in our materials, we see the atoning work of Yeshua, 
We see him in his kingly role and we see him in his suffering servant role. Well, just before we look at the tabernacle, when we come back next time, we'll look at the tent of meeting all around from the outside. We'll look at what's around the tabernacle on the outside, and then we're going to get to go inside to see what is inside the tabernacle. We're going to see that you cannot see without going in, that we have to enter into the court. We're going to see why you can't see. I will explain that fully, and there will be pictures to show you also, but there is a way in. There's something very special about the door that, that lets us in. We also will refer to the gate. We're going to see three entrances that take us into God's presence, and we're going to find the significance of why three. But if you want to know all the answers to that, come back next week. And once again, we will meet in our new location, and we will gather around the Word of God and have a feast at His feet as we go further into the pictures of the tabernacle articles to see how they show to us Messiah Yeshua Jesus, our Redeemer and our Savior, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, the one who came the first time a suffering servant and will return in all his Shekhinah glory to dwell with us and we with him forever. But we also get that personal indwelling through his shed blood even now. May the Lord bless you. I trust that the teaching has fed you um, beautifully or caused you beautifully to feast on who Messiah is and what he has done for us. Praise his holy name. Thank you.